Okay, um, good afternoon. Um, let us start our lecture. So um, last week uh, we talked about some continuous space, um, continuous distributions. So basically, uh, we for any distributions, you need to know about their probability functions or probability density functions, and what's the expectation, what is the variance. And also, uh, what kind of problem that can be modeled by this uh, type of distributions. So for continuous, we talk about uniform distributions. And there are some, we call it parameters, some constants to identify the distributions. So this basically saying that the random variable x takes any values with density function b minus a whenever x is between a and b and zero otherwise. And the expectation of x is equal to a plus b over 2 and the variance of x is equal to b minus a squared over 12. All right, so, so basically uh, what we can model the problem, the type of problem that can be modeled by uniform distribution is that we believe that uh, between two numbers is equally likely uh, for the random variable to take on certain value. And we also talk about exponential distributions with parameter alpha. So the PDF is equal to alpha e to the power minus alpha x for x greater equal to zero and zero otherwise. And the expectation of x is alpha and the variance of x is alpha square. Oh, sorry, one over alpha and one over alpha square. And alpha, sorry, x, um, if x is kind of uh, measure the survival time or the time to failure, then we can use this to exponential distributions to model the, the time to failure. All right, and uh, exponential distribution has this property called uh, memorous properties. What it means is that the probability of x greater equal to s plus t, given x greater than than t, or greater than s, is equal to probability of x greater than t. All right. So in other words, uh, given that the x the survival time or the time to failure has already passed S, then the chance that it will, it will last more than or longer than S plus T is the same as, it, it's as if it starts from scratch, start from a new start at this point. Forget about the past, it has survived S unit of time. All right, so it makes no difference between the two and we call this memorous property. So today we are going to talk about uh, the distribution called normal distributions uh, with two parameters, mu and sigma square. We talk about some properties about this normal distribution. It's a very popular distribution uh, because, at least because of two things. First of all, a lot of the physical phenomenon, uh, a, a lot of the data or the numbers that we see uh, seems follow uh, the normal distribution. Another um, reason that uh, normal distribution is so popular because of this uh, uh, central limit theorem, and in fact, it's more than just less central limit theorem. There are a lot of other um, behavior of uh, certain statistics. Um, when the sample size is big enough, they have a behavior like a normal distribution. I will discuss central limit theorem in the next chapter. All right, but uh, let's look at some properties of this. So uh, the PDF is like this: exponential minus x minus mu square over two sigma square for x between minus infinity and infinity. Expectation of x is mu, and variance of x is sigma square. All right, uh, 
So, that's what we are going to discuss today. All right, so uh, normal distributions. So a random variable x presumes all real values as a normal distribution or sometimes refer as Gaussian. So this is the first mathematicians that uh, discuss about this kind of distributions. Um, so if the distribution has this uh, formula or the form, as the probability density function. All right? And um, mu can be any number from minus infinity to infinity. Sigma is a number bigger than zero. All right? So different mu and sigma will give a normal distribution. So that infinite number of normal distributions. And we usually denote it by the notation n with the parameters, the first argument of this pair referring to the mean and the second one referring to the variance. So mu and sigma are called the parameters of normal distributions. So remember, for n so far, the distribution that we discussed, all right, they have a formula, a functional form. For normal, it looks very complicated, but it depends on three numbers. First is the x itself, and then we have mu and sigma. Mu and sigma, we call it parameters. They are unknown constants. They are constants, and you have to distinguish them. It's constant that we don't know, but they are constant. While x is the uh, value of the random variable or realization of the random variable, all right? So mu and sigma are constants. Remember, they are constants. It's just we don't know, all right? Okay, so the following are uh, some of the properties about normal distributions. So you have to know all this so that you, you, you can make full use of the normal distribution. So first of all, the normal distributions or the PDF of the normal distribution is a bell shape. That's why sometimes it's referred as bell curve. All right. So um, it looks like a cross section of a bell. All right. So uh, they center at x equal mu, and it is symmetrical about this line x equal mu. All right. So here I draw a graph with mu equals zero. All right. In fact, with sigmas equal one. So this is my graph. It can have infinite number of them, and it's symmetric about the mean. So in this case, because mu equals zero, so it's symmetric about zero. Okay, and the maximum occur at the point x equal to mu. In other words, the density function is at maximum when x equal to mu where x equal to mu. So it is at maximum, where x equal to mu. Then you can see that the density function getting smaller and smaller as the x values are getting further away from the mean. All right? So the maximum value is 1 over square root 2 pi sigma. So in other words, this, this one, this part, this height, where the maximum is, this is 1 over square root 2 pi, sigma. And in, my, in this graph, sigma equal to 1. So it's 1 over square root 2 pi. All right. So the third property is that the normal curve approaches to horizontal axis asymptotically as we proceed in either direction away from the mean. All right, so which, which means that this and this, this curve supposed to go extending to infinity and minus infinity. And as x getting bigger or getting, cold, big, uh, getting 
far away from the mu, is it goes closer to the x-axis. But it can never equal to zero. All right. Why? Because if you look at the density function, this one, this whole thing, no matter how big your x or how negative your x is, the PDF cannot be zero. It can be very small, very, very, very small, but it cannot be zero. So in other words, the graph here, the two tails extend, but they will not touch the x-axis, but are getting closer and closer. And it can be shown that the total area under the curve above the horizontal axis is equal to 1. So what it means is that this is a properly defined density function. The area under this curve, all right, between this curve and the x-axis, the area between this, under this curve, between this curve and x-axis should equal to zero because the, the, a PDF has to satisfy these properties. All right, so integrate, that means the area under the curve from minus infinity to infinity has to be one. <laughs> okay, the proof, the proof of this, 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 this thing is quite elaborate and um, uh, we won't go into it, all right? It's, it's kind of a trick that they used in order to prove that. They go to a, um, in fact, um, well, what, they, what, what we do usually is to uh, consider uh, x and y follow normal distributions. We consider instead one random variable, we consider two random variables, independent random variables, and then put them together and then consider, and then take the, the next step is to take some, we call it polar coordinate transformation. So instead of x and y coordinate, all right, they, we use r and theta. That means the distance and the angle. So uh, it's quite uh, a bit mathematical involved, so uh, we don't discuss it. But one thing that we should know with the knowledge of these modules, integrate from minus infinity to infinity, that means this part you should know. So in other words, we somehow, somewhere, we we have shown that this PDF of normal distribution is well defined. You can make use of these properties. In fact, not only this, uh, we also know the answer for this. So why is this? This is equal to mu. Because this is the expectation of x. How you find the expectation of x is to integrate x times f of x. All right? So in particular, if I, I want to ask, I want to find integrate from minus infinity to x, 1 over square root 2, and then exponential minus x square over x, dx. So what is this? What is the answer for this? Of course, this one is not too difficult to integrate. Use integration by pass, you'll get the answer. But then this basically is uh, expectation of x, where x follow a normal distribution with mean, and what's mu? Uh, I don't see any mu here. This means x minus zero, so the mean is zero. And what's the variance? The variance is two, all right? This is two times two square. So the variance is two two square. All right, so what's the answer? The answer is zero because it's equal to the expectation of x where x I identify from this integrand, identify x in fact can be considered or the whole integrand, all right, is the x times the PDF of a, stand, of a normal distribution, a PDF of a normal distribution with mean equal to zero and standard deviation or the variance equal to four, two square. So I don't have to do the integration. I can just make use of the properties of expectation of x. So long as you can identify is x times the PDF of a normal distribution. All right. 
Okay. So, um, so it can be shown that expectation of h equal to mu and variance of h equal to sigma square. Uh, a bit of work, uh, all right? Now, then um, another property is about two normal curves. That means two normal distributions. If they have the same sigma square, the sigma square, the variance are the same for these distributions, then they are, their shape is the same. So that's why sometimes sigma or sigma square is referred as the, the shape parameter. So it identifies the shape in normal distribution. So here is an example. So you can see that the solid curve is with variance equal to one. The, doc, the dashed line curve also have a variance equal to one. So they have the same shape. The only difference is that one is shift because the, the center are, the, are different. This one is center at zero, while this one is center at two. This one is center at two, this one is center at zero. All right? So, mu is considered as location of the distribution. Where this PDF locate depends on mu. So the, that, the solid line represents the mu equals zero, and um, the dashed line represents the mu equals to two. All right, so how about same mean, but different variance? All right, so you can see that now with the variance equal to one, then the curve, um, uh, okay, okay, uh, I think one, okay, that unfortunate, a bit confused. I think this two referring to the standard deviation. Um, when I type it, so this is the standard deviation. All right. So, um, but it doesn't matter. So here it say that okay, when sigma increases, so increase from one to two, then the curve itself, all right, stay in the center is still zero, but the the distribution with the standard deviation equal to two is fatter. All right. While the curve or the normal curve with standard deviation equal to one is sharpened or sharp. That means it, it, it's thinner. This one is fatter. This part is fatter while this one is thinner. So what it means is that if the standard deviation is small or the variance is small, it basically means that the value of x is more concentrated around the mean. So make the probability density higher. All right. While if the standard deviation or the variance is small, compared with this, then it's less, it's less concentrated or more spread out. All right, so that's why you see a factor than uh, a curve. Now this is very important. Important in the sense that the idea is very useful. Basically it's saying that, okay, I have X follow normal distribution with mean, mu, and sigma square, variance sigma square, then if I define z, which is x minus the mean, divided by the standard deviation, the square root of the variance, then this one is called z, then we can show, obviously, expectation of z is equal to expectation of x minus mu, one over sigma, which turned out to be uh, one over sigma, mu minus mu, so it's equal to zero. Variance of z is equal to one over sigma square times variance of x, which is sigma square over sigma square equal to one. So what does that mean? It means that if I minus the mu divided by the standard deviation, then I will get a new random variable with mean zero and very standard deviation equal to one. So z is called, uh, has a, uh, a distribution of mean zero and one, and we call this a standard normal distribution. It's very useful because this will be considered as the standard with mean zero and standard deviation equal to one. All right. So any random variable x can convert to a standard normal by minus the mean and, and divide by the standard deviation. All right. So the PDF obviously is written in this form. 
no mu, no sigma square, because a standard normal is known to have a mean zero and variance equal to one, or standard deviation equal to one. All right. So one of the usefulness of the standard normal distribution is that we can, we can table the, the PDF, all right? So, and for any distribution, if you, you look at the event X, which follow normal mu sigma square, less uh, lies between X1 and X2, then this is equivalent to, all right, X less than X2 at, and greater than X1. So I minus mu on both sides of the two inequalities and then divide by sigma. This one is standard normal, all right? So uh, it's equivalent to Z, a standard normal lines between these two numbers. Now what does that mean? It means, uh, so basically, if I say X between three and four, for example, where X follows a normal distribution, I can convert it to a standard normal between two numbers. Then, um, basically, okay, if we convert to maybe like this, lah, x between x1 and x2, maybe after we, we standardize it, it becomes a minus 1.5 and let's say 2. All right? So what it means is that the event x lies between little x1 and little x2 is equivalent to z lies between minus 1.5 and 2. Okay, that's what the number says. But in fact, you can also interpret as this is equivalent to Z. Okay, X between X1 and X2 is equivalent to Z between, uh, uh, is lies between 1 and 1.5 standard deviations below the mean and two standard deviation above the mean, all right? So the idea is that these this, this two numbers, this whole statement here, if you convert it, after you convert it, it turns out to be Z lies between two numbers. Then these two numbers can be interpreted as how many standard deviation from the mean. So minus 1.5 is equivalent to minus 1.5 huh? is equivalent to minus 1.5 times sigma uh, plus mu, all right? Where mu is zero and sigma is one. So it's equivalent to, because it's minus, so it's below the mu, less than mu. So it is one and a half standard deviation from the mean, all right? And this is two standard deviation above the mean. And the mean is zero because that's what the standard normal is. So this standardized standardization is a very useful. It tells you something about, um, about the behavior of the random variable. Um, Okay, so Z1, Z2. So this probability is the same as this probability where Z1 is equal to this and Z2 is equal to this. All right, okay, so let's look at this example. So we have a norm, a random variable A suppose follow normal distribution with mean 50 and standard deviation 10. So what is the probability of X between 45 and 62? So of course you can link take out your graphic calculator and then press this one, all right? Or use your computer to find out. But what I want you to aware is that this one can be translated after I standardize it, all right? Minus the mean, divide by the standard deviation. So I have to do the same thing for these two. So it worked out to be 
set between minus 0.5 and 1.2. What does that mean? It means that x follow normal with mean 50 and variance 10 square is equivalent to a standard normal between minus 0.5 and 1.2, which means that this statement simply means that, okay, x is, or 45 is, is 0.5 standard deviation from the mean, from the mean, or below, sorry, below the mean. While 62 is 1.2 standard deviation above the mean. All right? Standard deviation is 10, and mean is 50. How do I know it? Because after I convert it, this will be, will be the, the number for standard normal as a reference. So it's 0.5 standard deviation below the mean and 1.2 standard deviation above the mean. All right, so then I walk out. So it's equal to Z less than 1.5 minus probability of Z less than minus 0.5. So, uh, okay, then this part is the, for us to use statistical table. You may have to be um, aware of that. So the table will give you the upper uh, tails. So in other words, give any Z it gives you this probability. So that's why I convert this into one minus probability of Z less or you, I quickly or you go to 1.2. So this supposed to be, if I, this is 1.2, I want to get this probability. But instead I got this one and then subtract it from one. Then this part, all right? We are supposed to look at Z, the chance less than minus 0.5. But because normal distribution is symmetric above the mean, and this standard normal, the mean is zero. So it's symmetric about zero. So this area is the same as this area greater than 0.5. So it's z greater than 0.5. These two probability are the same. All right, because the standard normal distribution is symmetric about zero. All right, so we take I'll read these numbers from the uh, statistical table. So here it is. All right, this is how the table look like. All right. Uh, okay. So it tells you it's the upper cumulative probability. That means the right hand tails. So this is the Z value and the Z value with, um, okay, 1.2. So it reads as Z equal to 1.2, zero. All right, if you want 1.28, for example, then it will be this number. All right, this column heading read the second decimal place of the Z value. So if you want 1.25, then it will be this number, this number. This number means that this number means that it is the probability of a standard normal greater or equal to 1.25 with a probability equal to 0 0 0.1056. All right, that's how we read it. Okay. So how about if I want probability of Z greater than 1.234? Uh, 1.2345, how to get it? Okay, we don't want, to have, okay, there are many ways to do it. 1.2345, so it's between 1.23 and 1.24, so it's somewhere between these two numbers. If I want to know probability of Z greater than 1.2345, so it's somewhere between 1.23 and 1.25. Oh, sorry, 1.2, um, 1.23 and 1.24, all right. Uh, one way is to do something called linear interpolation, all right, because you have a function, you know the two points, you just take the linear interpolation, take the ratio thing. 
The second approach is even easier. Just take the average. All right. One point two three four five is not exactly in the midpoint, but we just take the average of the two x value, uh, y values. Uh, the third approach is even easier. Just take the nearest one that you think is suitable. One point two three four five. So I will take one point two three lah. Right. So I will take this value. I just want you to know that there are many ways to do it, so long as you justify it. So for this module, I think we accept uh, either you do a linear interpolation, supposed to be more accurate, or just take the average. All right, it's not so accurate. Take the average between the two. So what I mean is like this. If I go back to uh, where are we? Uh? Resume slideshow. Okay. So what I mean is that if I want to know probability of Z greater than 1.2345, all right? So here we know when Z equal to 1.23 and when Z equal to 1.24. Okay, we know this value, we know this value. So either you take a linear interpolation, that means you, you assume that the function is a straight line, a, a straight line function, or you take the midpoint. 1.235, which is still the average of these two numbers. Or even, I just take 1.23, take this value, which is closest to this. I mean, this is closer to 1.23 than 1.24. All right. So uh, we will accept any of this. All right. So my, my point is, in some other situations, if you're given some information in the table form, and it, the exact value is not displayed on the t in the table, the how to get the air value, you, so you try to get the answer. You cannot say, I don't know, so try to get it. So one way more accurate is to do a linear interpolation. The other way is take, just take the average, or the third way, just take the nearest, right? Uh, OK, here's. Um, that's the tilt table. And sometimes people use this notation to denote the CDF of a standard normal. But we, we, uh, we can use that. All right. So, um, so phi 1.2 means probability of a standard normal less than 1.2, which is 0 0.8849. All right. So in our statistics table, it is 0 0.11, um, 0 0.1151. All right. Okay. Um, so the table that I gave you in the in the IVLE or the luminous is for the upper tail. So we are given this. All right. So you have to be aware of that. Um, so please, when you read the statistical table, read the description. So although I try to give you the upper tails or the right-hand tails, but some tables from textbook or from uh, other people provide may give you the, the left-hand side. So in other words, the, this one is what we usually give you, this probability, greater than a certain value. While some other, uh, they will give you this part. So you have to read the legend or the description of the table uh, before you use it. All right, so, so for example, when we say uh, Z.05, it means the chance greater than this number, which is 1.45, uh, 1.645, is 5%. So this means that this is a standard normal. This is 1.645 for a standard normal. And chance greater than it is 0 0.05, 5%. So we write it as Z. At 0 0.05. Lowercase z is the value. With a subscript 0 0.05 means that this is a value for which a standard normal greater than this value with 5% chance. And this value is 1.645. And for 1%, it is even bigger, it's 2.326. And 
So because of symmetry around zero, so z greater than z alpha is the same as the random variable z less or equal to negative z alpha. That means this area is the same as minus 1.645. These two areas are the same. All right? Of course, because of symmetry, so minus z, the PDF is the same as z. Because it doesn't matter whether you put z here or minus z, it's the same PDF. Okay, so for example, x is normally distributed with mean 3 and standard deviation 0 0.5. Then what's the chance that x less than 2.3 or greater than 2.5? or between 3.5 and 4. So we standardize. So x, because remember, x is a normal distribution with mean equal to 3 and standard deviation 0.5. All right? So therefore, I minus the mean divided by the standard deviation, so it's minus 1.5. So in other words, x less than 2.3 is equivalent to saying that it is one. Uh, it is a uh, one point four. One point four standard deviation below the mean. One point four standard deviation below the mean. All right. So it's the same as uh, greater than one point four standard deviation. So it's point zero eight zero. Uh, point zero eight zero eight. So similarly for the others. So x greater than two point five is equivalent to uh, saying that, okay, x basically is one standard deviation above the mean. All right. This one, by just looking at 2.5, you cannot tell it's one standard deviation above the mean. So after you call, oh, so, sorry, uh, it's greater than uh, one standard deviation below the mean. It has a ne negative, I'm sorry, negative one. So what I'm trying to say is that by looking at this one, you don't know how many standard deviations. But after you standardize it, mean immediately I know that how, where is it. So now I'm asking for what's the chance that x greater than 2.5 is the same as asking a standard normal random variable greater than 1 minus 1.5, uh, minus 1. So in other words, this 2.5 in fact is equivalent to one standard deviation below the mean. So we the probability is 0.8. 413. All right, between these two, we standardize it. It means that between 4 and 3.5 is the same as saying that it is between uh, 1 and 2 standard deviation. All right, this is 1 standard deviation above the mean. This is 2 standard deviation above the mean. So x lies between 1 standard deviation and 2 standard deviation above the mean. All right, so, so this is probability of z between 1 and 2. So it's the equivalent of z less than 2 minus probability of z less than 1. So because I want to use my table, I convert it to the right-hand tail. So 1 minus this number, and this is also 1 minus this number. All right, so it's equivalent to 1 minus probability of z greater or equal to 2 minus bracket 1 minus probability of z greater or equal to 1. So this 1 cancel out, so it's equivalent to z greater than, greater or equal to 1 minus probability of z greater or equal to 2. All right, so the answer is 0 0.13595. All um, Okay, this one, uh, you will not be tested on this one, but that's for your own um, interest. If you want to use Excel, all right, if your graphic calculator is not at handy, then the, you use this one. So this is the function, norm.dist. There are four arguments here. So this is the, if I want to find this probability, the first argument is the, the limit or the x, and then you, are, you have to give the two parameters of the normal distribution, and the third argument is true true means that you are working on the CDF or the cumulative probability. 
cumulative probability. If not, if you put it false, so what number will the Excel return to you? So it will not be the cumulative probability, but instead it will give you the, it's not the probability, it is probability density function, all right? For the continuous case. Okay, so if I want to find out the probability of x less than 45, then I have to put 45 here, mean is 50, and oh, uh, there's an error here. It's not 102, it should be 10 square, all right? 10 square, not 102, it's 10 square. So the standard deviation is 10 and 2. So it will give you 0 0.308. So it's another example. So if you, you can use this function, cause put an S in between, it's the standard normal. Then you don't have to type this part, the mean and the standard deviation. So you just type Z, and then we'll return you with the CDF of standard normal. All right? Okay. Um, sometimes we will like Okay, just now the function is to calculate, given the z, try to work out the probability. But sometimes we would like to give this p, and what is this value? It's the inverse function, all right? So this will tell us that, okay, I want to find, th th this one, I want to find a value, I call it a, such that the chance less than it is 88%. I want to find, so I want to find this value such that this is a 0 0.088 area. So, oh, uh, okay, that, that shouldn't just uh, semicolon, no comma. Okay, so I use this function called inverse, norm dot inverse, with this as the prob cumulative probability and the, uh, and the, Mean and uh, standard deviation. Again, there's a typo here. I overlook. It should be seven square, not seven two. Huh? Seven square. All right. So the value is eighty two point two two five, which means that if x follow normal with mean seventy four and standard deviation seven, then this number. All right. Eighty. This number eighty two point two two five. All right. We'll have a probability eighty eight percent. All right. All right. So uh, for standard normal, you just put an S in between the norm and inverse. Okay. So uh, let's check how we use for the normal distribution to model our problem and solve our problem. So our common test: the average grade is seventy-four, and the standard deviation is seven. So we would like to find out, if I want to give 12% A's, so what should be the cutoff point? So uh, what's the lowest possible A and the highest possible B? That means the cutoff. So this value above it, you got A. Below it, you got B. All right. So this is the marks, X, follow normal with mean 74 and standard deviation 7. So now I want to get a pawn such that Above it is 12%. Below it is 0.88. So what is this number? All right. So, so here is the solution. We try to get probability x greater than this x. We want to know what is this x such that it is 0.12. So we standardize it. Standardize it. So it's a standard normal bigger than this number equal to 0.12. All right. But on the other hand, from the standard normal, we know that z is equal to 1.175. Okay, so uh, how to get this number? Oh. oh okay, so cannot open it. Eh? Um,
Okay, so this is a normal distributions. So what we want is a number such that in standard normal, greater than this number with 12% chance. So how to get this number from the table? We discussed given Z, so these are the probability on the right, all right? So now we are given 0.12, try to get the Z. So I look for 0.12 here. So 0.12, where's 0.12? Ah, oh, it's somewhere here, these two numbers, all right? These are the probability, one is uh, 0.121, the other is 0.119. So exactly in the middle between the two. So which Z value gives you 0.121? 1.17. And uh, what's the value give you the probability of 0.119? It's 1.18. Uh, so I just take the average of these two numbers. So I find out that the value is one point, average of 1.17 and 1.18. So it's 1.175. All right? So uh, just like what I told you before, here I take the average of the two. Or you think, okay, one point, I want point one two, right? So I can take 1.17 as my answer. It's the, uh, not the nearest, but then we just take one of them. Either take 1.17 or 1.18. Of course, the slightly better is to take 1.1, uh, average of 1.17 and 1.18. So that's how we read, how use the table to get the inverse. All right. Okay. So. So, now we know that Z is equal to one point one seven five, such that the probability of Z greater than Z is equal to zero point one two. All right. So now I substitute back. This is my x minus seventy four over seven. So convert it x equal to 82.225. So the cutoff point, if you are bigger than 82 or 83, you got A. If you got 82, too bad, it's below the cutoff point, so you got a B. All right. So um, it's quite a high standard or quite an easy Tesla. All right. Okay, uh, this is what I just mentioned earlier. So do the linear interpolation. It basically is a ratio thing, all right? So, uh, so I want to find, all right? This is um, 1 point, 1 point 1.17 and 1 1.18. Okay, this pawn gives you 0.121. This pawn gives you 0.119. And I, my, my pawn one two is somewhere here. All right, but we, how, how do I know which one? So I just join a line. So I will take, I will take the pawn here. All right. So how do I do it? Alpha is supposed here. So I make sure that alpha minus one point one seven compared with one point one eight minus one point one seven. This is the x ratio on the x axis. Then I do the same thing. So this is point one two. So it's point one two mi minus one. 0.121 compare with 0.119. All right, so it, it will be like that. So compare with pawn, the difference here and the difference here. Compare the difference here and the difference here. All right, so that's the idea. So I work out alpha or A equal to 1.175. All right. So this part is the A, A. All right, A. So relative to this pawn and this one pawn one relative to this pawn. So the same apply here. So now this pawn, oh, A, A should be here. All right. So this pawn is my Y, which is pawn one two. So I measure how far it is from one uh, pawn one seven, pawn one two one, and also uh, pawn one one nine. How far it is from pawn one two one. So take the ratio, this basically is a ratio thing, and you got 1.175. All right, um, 
So if you have problem, you just take the average uh, between the two. So don't have to do the linear interpolation or just take the nearest. All right, so um, how about if I want to find a 60 percentile, all right? Which means that I try to look for x, remember x follow a normal with mean certain number and standard deviation. Now I want to look for x such that the chance less than x is 0.6, all right? So um, from standard normal, this value is 0.2533. So in other words, it is this number, 0.2533. So it's a two, a 0.2533 standard deviation above the mean will have a probability, this will have a probability equal to 0.6. All right. Any distribution, any normal distribution, the chance of a value, all right, um, the value is 0.2533 standard deviation above the mean will be, uh, less than that number is 60, uh, 0.6. All right, so what we have to do is just convert it. So Z, this is my little Z. So now I work out Z equal to X minus, little X minus 74 divided by the standard deviation. So this number is 0.2533. So I just work it out. So X is 75.77. So that means this is the value for which less than this value with 60% chance. If the x is a random variable follow normal distribution with mean equal to 74 and standard deviation is 7. All right, so uh, here is another application of normal distribution. So x is the amount of sugar, okay, filling uh, the packets of sugar, all right, and this supposed follow a normal distribution with mean, mu, with standard deviation equal to four. And we asked, if I only want 2% of the packets of sugar, it's less than 500 gram. So what should the meal, what should be the meal? So in other words, the problem is like this. I have a machine, so you try to set, put in the sugar, but this amount of sugar fill in is fluctuating. Different package will have different amount of sugar fill in. But basically, the amount fill in follow a normal distribution with a mean equal to mu. I can, I can set the target value at mu. All right, so it's above mu or sometimes above mu, sometimes below mu. All right, but now the question is, I want to set the mu. Uh, if you set the mu as 500, then obviously it's, it's not good. What it means is that half of your package, half of your packets will be less than 500 gram. If a consumer, you, you mentioned that this pack, this, uh, this pack of sugar should weigh 500 gram and half of the chance I will get something less. So I'm not happy. All right. So, so I want to set only 2% of, of the packets of sugar will be less than 500 gram. All right. So uh, can I make it to 100? 100%, I mean, 0%, you cannot. Uh, okay, of course, practically you can set like, okay, 500 gram, I feel everyone target at one kilogram, 1,000 gram. Wow, so generous. But then in that case, there's still one, a, a very small chance that you will have something, although with standard deviation for, uh, almost all the package will be more than 500 gram uh, if you set mu equal to 1,000. But I want to set mu such that only 2%. So in other words, the probability of x less than, less than uh, 500, this one I know is 500, is only 2%. And x follow normal mu four square. So you see, here, I set up an equation. I want the number or the percentage of packets of uh, sugar less than 500 gram with 2% chance. So I set up the equation. Where's the unknown? X is not unknown, but 
the distribution of x is unknown. At least we have mu that we don't know. So I can, I can change this mu value so that I solve for this equation to find the mu. This equation. Of course, at this point, you don't see a mu. Lah. But uh, think of it, I can standardize it. So x minus mu divided by 4, less than 500 minus mu divided by 4. The probability of this one equal to 0 0.02. So I have, I standardized it, so now I see a mu here. But this one is standard normal. So I go and ask myself, what is a standard normal? Less than a constant equal to 2%. Then I set up my equation. The equation will be this number equal to this number. This number A, this A, I use the notation A, but in fact you can look from the statistics table or use a calculator to, to convert this A. All right, so um, that's how we do it. So I want to find or solve for mu, satisfy this equation. I try to get a mu involved, so it's like that. So, all right, so now from statistics table, this is the value for which greater than it is 2%. So in other words, this number, all right, this number, should equal to, oh sorry, not this number. This number should equal to 2.0537, all right? This one is from the question. This part, this part is from, this is a well-known fact, this is a fact. This is from Settle's table, all right? So one hand, I have this, this this whole equation, all right, involves the questions, come from the question. This one is the fact. So I just link up these two through this part, all right. So I have this equation. So I set up an equation and solve for mu. So mu is 508.2. So in other words, if I want to set my machine so that only 2% will be below my target, I need to set the mean equal to 508.2. All right, I set 508.2. Then the, the amount of sugar dispensed will be sometimes below 508, sometimes above 508. But only 2% will be less than 500. All right. Okay. Uh, so here's another, another question. Uh, this one, this is a good question you cannot solve using your calculator because there are no x value. The question just saying that, okay, if we know that this breaking down voltage follow a normal distribution, that's it, no mu, no sigma square. You are not given the mu, not given sigma square. And they ask you, what's the chance that the breakdown voltage lies within one standard deviation of the mean? What's the mean? What is the standard deviation? You are not given. Then how to solve? All right. So, x, uh, one standard deviation. So basically, you are asked to find this one. The random variable follow normal with mean mu and sigma uh, variance sigma square. What is this probability? To all my calculator. The calculator was mu, was sigma square. It's not there. All right. So, what to do? So I standardize it. Ah, suddenly I have a number. So it, this one is the standard normal. So it basically, we are asked to find the probability of a normal random variable lies between one standard deviation below the mean and one standard deviation above the mean. It's the same as a standard normal between one and minus one. So now I can find out the probability, all right? So uh, the rest, you can do it yourself, all right? So my point is that, yes, the idea of convert the statement involved x, all right, into a standard normal so that you know how many standard deviation from the mean, maybe above or below, all right? So uh, this is what I just told you. So the answer is 0.6826. In fact, this is also a very useful guideline. It's basically saying that 
for any standard, sorry, for any normal distribution, the values lies between one standard deviation and minus one standard deviation. That means one standard deviation above the mean and one standard deviation below the mean. It's about 68% chance. All right. Mu lies between mu sigma and mu minus sigma. Lies between these two numbers. Lies between these two numbers. The probability is about 68%. Similarly, lies between two standard deviation above the mean and below the mean is 95%. 95%. Then how about three standard deviation? If I remember correctly, there's three standard deviation, maybe 98 something percent. All right? Three standard deviation. You go and check. All right? Oh. Sorry, 99.8%. My mistake. All right, 99.8%. Three standard deviation. So that's why uh, it's very unlikely to see a normal distribution. All right, takes the value beyond four standard deviation. Beyond three standard deviation is already be only, uh, only what? Only 0.0026% chance it will outside the three standard deviation range. Four standard deviation is even, even wider, so that means the chance is even smaller. So for standard normal or for any normal distribution, the values outside three standard deviation is, is 0 0.0026, very small. All right. All right. Um, so here is another example. So we want to specify that, uh, okay, if the components of our measurement is normally distributed with mean 1.5 and standard deviation 1. Point, uh, sorry, 0. 0.0, so we want to specify D, all right, so that um, the specific cover 95% of the measurement. So this is, just ask, okay, what is the probability of X lies between 1.5, this is what you specified, this is the specification. That means, okay, I want my items to be between these two numbers, this is my specification. If you don't meet the specification, I will reject your component. All right, so I want to make sure that this one will be at least 95%. So I want to determine what is this D. You can have a D very huge, so you'll have a very large range, all right? then you may accept everything. But if it's too small, if your D is very small, then your range is very small, then you may, you may have a problem, you reject too many. All right, so we want to find out this D. Suppose if the measurements is with mean 1.5 and standard 1.2. So we just work it out, all right? So standardize it and then we got, solve it, and D turned out to be, uh, 0.392. So in other words, with X follow normal with mean, what is the mean? Eh? Yeah, 1.5 and standard deviation 0.2. So 1.5 and standard 1.5 and standard deviation 0.2. Then the probability of X between 1.5 minus D which is 1.96, or 1.5 plus 1.96, then this is 0.95. All right? Oh, oh I'm sorry. 1.96 times 2, uh, 0 0.2. Uh, so this is, this is the D, minus 0.392, plus 0.392. All right. Basically, it's saying that D should be, this is standard deviation, it's 1.96 times the standard deviation. Your specification is that it is 1.96 standard deviation above the mean and below the mean. And work it out because the standard deviation is 0 0.2, so the value is 0 0.392. Okay, so now we leave the standard normal and about something else. 
So it's a normal approximation to binomial distribution. So remember, uh, in the, in the, when we talk about Poisson, we can also use Poisson to approximate the binomial. All right? Uh, if you recall, that is when n is big and p is small, or 1 minus p is small. But for normal, so, so for p is in the middle, approach to the middle, half, all right? not too extreme, then it's better to use a normal distribution because in that case, the binomial distribution is more look like a symmetric distribution and it's better approximate by a normal distribution. So, so as a rule of thumb, if when n p greater than five and m times one minus p is greater than five, then the approximation should be quite okay. All right. So here is just a graph to show that with n equal to fifteen and p equal to point four, you can see that is quite symmetrical. So with n equal to 50 and p equal to 0 0.2, the p is not that close to 0 0.5, but then it's still quite symmetrical, all right? Because n p is bigger than oh, n p, so uh, it is uh, bigger than 5. n p, which is 50 times 0 0.2, which is equal to 10 greater than 5, n times 1 minus p, which is 50 times 0.8. So it's 40 also greater than 5. So that we expect the approximation to be quite okay. All right. So uh, if x follow a binomial distribution with mean, so binomial with parameter n and p. Therefore, the expectation of x is equal to n p and the variance of x is equal to n p times 1 minus p. So, therefore, the random variable minus its mean divided by the square root of the variance of x is approximately a standard normal. It's approximately a standard normal. All right, so we can use this, for example, x follow binomial with n equal to 15 and p equal to 0.4, probably x equal to 4 is 0.1268. If I use normal approximation, then y will follow uh, the mean is n times p, the variance n p times 1 minus p. All right. So, so now, this is something that you have to pay attention x equal to 4. You cannot write x equal to 4 and then approximate by probability of y equal to 4. What I mean is that this is a discrete random variable. While y is normal, which is continuous. So at the beginning, we better convert x equal to 4 means x between 3.5 and 4.5. Right? That is called continuity correction. Then I convert it, it's approximate by y. All right. Y is a, 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 a approximate distribution. X follow a bi binomial, y follow a normal. So it's between the same two numbers, and after I standardize it, and I got the answer. 0 0.121, 1214, which is not very different from the exact distribution. The exact distribution for this one is 0.1218. So it's quite close. So this approximation is quite good. All right? Okay, here's a bunch of continuity correction. Wow. Very complicated. But if you understand the principle, it's not that hard. First of all, Remember, x are discrete. So if x equal to k means that, all right, x equal to k. So this is k minus 1, this is k plus 1. So probability of x equal to k means that x is uh, between k minus half and k plus half. All right? So just 
just involved half uh, from less than it and half bigger than it. All right, so it's between x between x minus half and k uh, x between k minus half and x less than k plus half. All right. Well, now if I want to compute x between a and b, uh, remember here include a uh, because x is a discrete random variable, so you pay attention to the equal sign. It include a. So in other words, here is a. And this is B. So it extends to half less than A. So it's up to A minus half. And on the other hand, because it includes B, so you have to extend cover up to B plus half. B plus half. So that's why it's between X between A minus half and B plus half. All right? Now, how about this one? This one, it does not include A. So A is excluded. So in other words, this is A. And then your probability is up to this point, which is half bigger than A. So that's why it is up to A plus half. All right? So there's the basic principle. So of course, uh, X less or equal to C is supposed to be all right, from zero to C, including zero. Because X for binomial, for binomial, eh, we're talking about binomial, X cannot be negative. So therefore, the lower bound is zero, including zero. So it's from minus half up to C plus half. All right. So it's very simple. If, if it's included that particular value, then you have to consider whether you have to add or subtract. All right, whether it extend, if it is on the right-hand side, then you have to add. If it's on the left-hand side, that means less than, then you have, to, you have to extend it to minus half. All right? So it's very simple, although it looks complicated. All right? So similarly, x greater than c, so it's from c plus half up to n plus half. All right? So here is an example. Suppose we have a system set with 100 components and each has a reliability of 0.9. All right? And then each component fails or not or works independently. All right? So we asked, the system, the whole system works if at least 80 of the components function. All right? so, so in other words, if X is the number of component works, that means number of success out of 100 components. Because the whole system has 100 components. All right? So X follow a binomial distribution with N equal 100 and probability of success is 0.9. And what we are asked, whether the chance the system functioning, we are asked what is the chance X greater or at least at least tier. So we're asked to find this probability. All right. Of course, you can use the binomial distribution to do it, but here we just demonstrate how to use the normal approximation. So we're asked to find this probability. So, so we find expectation of x is 90, variance is 9. So we want to find x between 80 and 90 inclusive. So. We standardize it minus the mean divided by the standard deviation. And, and so now this one I consider as a standard normal. And this, is, this whole thing is minus 3.5. This is 3.5. So in other words, uh, we want to have x between 90, uh, 80 and 100 is the same as saying that uh, it is 3.5 between 3.5 standard deviation and be above and below uh, the mean for a standard normal. So the chance is 0.99995. All right. Since the component has a, a probability of 0.9 being work, I mean, uh, working, so uh, you have so many components, 100 of them, and the chance that at least 80 of them working is 0.995. All right. 
So the more components that you put in, it guarantees the system works with high probability. If you try to cut costs, let's say, how about if I have only, only um, I need 80, right? So how about if I put 80 of them? So in other words, my system instead of 100 components, now I reduce to 80. So all 80 works and the system works. If one fails, then system fails. So it's almost sure that it, it fails, all right? Because it's where my, what I say is that if X, we only have 80 components. So X is the number of components working, all right? Followed by normal 80 with probability 0.9. So the system works with all the components work. So that means 0.9 raised to power 80. You, uh, all right, so this is how it works. You make sure that everyone works. So this is the probability. All right. Oh, so, um, okay. I still have 10, 15 minutes. Mm. Okay. This is to move away from probability. Uh, in fact, you cannot move away. You still work on the probability. But now we are talking about some inference or statistics. All right? Uh, but you, you have to link the probability and the statistic inference through this sampling distribution. But uh, we also talk about sampling. So we are talking about population and sample, random sample, and the sampling distribution of certain quantity about a sample. So we, we concentrate on sample mean. We can also talk about the sample variance. The sampling distribution of sample variance. What, is it, what does it mean? It means that you take one sample, calculate the mean. You take another sample, you calculate the mean. In fact, you can have a, a number of the samples, which give you, each of which gives you a mean. So you have a bunch of sample mean. So how the sample means behaves. So that's, uh, we try to describe using a distribution, and that is called sampling distribution. So we talk about central limit theorem, and it's a very useful theorem. Um, and we also talk about the sampling distri distribution between the difference between two sample means and the chi-square distribution and the t-distribution. These are on top of what we discussed in chapter four. Now we have two more distributions. They are very useful to model some of the sampling distribution. Chi-square distribution is to model this the distribution is to model this. T distribution is to model this quantity. All right? Okay, population and sample. You know in English what is the word population? Huh? How many people in, in Singapore? So that is the population, all right? Um, in statistics, it is the totality of all possible outcomes or observations in an experiment or in a survey, like toss a con, all right? The outcome is head or tail, for example. Then the population supposed to be um, all possible thoughts of, of a con. So it can be infinite of them. But only the outcome is either head or tail. I toss it once, I got head or tail. Another time, a third time, so I can toss it infinite number of times. So the population will be an infinite population. Each is represent the outcome of toss a con, including those you toss in the past, toss it right now, or toss it in the future. All right, while well, sample is a subset of the population. So we try to uh, look at this subset and then try to draw inference about the populations. All right. So um, that's what we are going to do in the next three chapters. So there are two kinds of population, finite and infinite populations. So uh, finite population means that the number of elements or possible outcomes are finite. So that is easy. All right, for example, all the citizens of Singapore or all the books in science library, all right, they are finite. 
infinite population is harder. But in fact, it's not that hard. It basically consists of elements which is either consider a very large number of elements, all right, or basically they are they 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 um, they are so large that you can count, but it is infinite of them. Or the other one is even worse, uncountable. That means you cannot count. It's so huge that you cannot count. It's just a very simple example is that I draw a line between zero and one and ask you how many pawns are there. We cannot count how many pawns on the line. Just zero, one, a very short line. How many pawns are there? Infinite number of them. In fact, you cannot count. So it's, so it's uncountable, so many. How about the real line? How many pawns are there? It's also infinite number of them and also uncountable. So it's very strange, huh? Part of the line is infinite number of pawns. The whole real line is also infinite number of pawns. All right? Okay, so here's uh, one example. Uh, all possible rows of a pair of die. All possible, huh? What's this all possible? Means that you can roll, 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 keep rolling, keep getting the outcome, uh, experiment outcome. Uh, so it's infinite number of them. Another example is to draw a digit from these 10 digits with replacement. What does it mean? It means that I take one number, one digit out of this 10. After that, I put it back, I take another one. All right? And then after that, I put it back. So I can do this without stopping. That means I can continuous draw digits from this 10. So that is an infinite population. All right? So it's, it's funny, huh? I only have 10 digits. But what I'm interested is to, from this, this, this I, I can consider this 10 digits. In fact, it's an infinite population. All right? Many, many of them. But each of one, each of them is either zero, one, two, up to nine. All right? So in other words, let me, okay, this is the population. The infinite numbers, num, infinite individual there. And each of them is either zero, a one, a two, or so on, up to nine. But how many of them? Infinite number of them. So that is considered as an infinite population. Now, so here's a problem. If I want to describe an infinite population, or a finite population is easier because it's finite. So like all, pop, all Singapore citizens, so everyone has an IC or have a name or have IC, IC better. So I have an IC, so you can identify them. For infinite population, all right, the infinite number of them, but, but like for this example, I have um, only finite possible value for them. So to describe the pop infinite population, one way to do it is to use a prob probability function or probability density function. So in this case, I describe this population, okay, um, like this. All right, this population follow a probability density function equal to 1 over 10 if it takes the value 0, 1, 2, up to 9. All right, so in other words, the chance of getting a 0 from this population is 1 tenth. That means 1 tenth of this population, I don't care how many of them, but 1 tenth of them are zeros. And another 1 tenth is also uh, is 1. Another one tenth is two. Another one tenth is three, and so on. So that's how we describe an infinite population. All right. So, um, so here's. So sometimes uh, the, but finite, but it's large. So we will describe it as infinite. All right. Okay. Uh, this is uh, useful. Um, how to select the sample. I say sample is just a subset of the population. But you cannot just, just arbitrarily take one. It must satisfy certain criteria in order to apply the statistical theory or the inference that we draw. All this, what you heard about it, t-test, 
or your normal the test, all this, they are based on statistical theory, which need random, simple, I mean a random sample. So here I, we discuss with a simple one. So suppose I have a, a population, I want to take n, n individual from this population, all right? So then I call that a sample because it's part of the population and a sample of size n because I take n out of this population, n individuals out of this population. So population, finite or infinite, I take a sample with n observations. There are n observations here, all right? So each observation in the population can be considered as the value of the random variable given by this f of x, all right? A simple random sample is just saying that, uh, just saying that any subset of n observation from the population has equal probability being selected. Wow, looks complicated. Uh, a simple definition but not complete is that everyone has equal chance of being selected. It's considered a simple random sample. But this is not the exact, the correct definition. But make it easy, okay? That means at least everyone has equal chance being selected. But what I'm saying here is that Okay, for this population, you take a set of n observations. Suppose that n, capital N. How many ways that I can choose lead to n out of n? So this is number of ways of choosing. So let's say I have 100, the population have 100 individuals. I want to select 9 out of this 100. How many ways that I can get 9 out of this 100? So it is choose 9 out of 100. So in this case, I choose little n out of capital N. There's so many ways. And each of this represent one sample. So all this sample of size n have equal chance of being selected. That means each one will have a probability being selected as 1 over like that. Then that is a random sample. All right. Um, let's look at it. Uh, I, have, I have 10 individuals, A, A, B, C, D, up to J. I want to select two, a sample of two, all right? So uh, what I'm saying is that I can have so many choices, choose two out of these 10. So each one has equal probability. But I can also have the following way to select. I, I select in the following way. When I, when I, okay, I will put it like this. A, uh, A, B, C, D, E, F, one sample. B, uh, B, F, G, C, H, D, I, and E, J. Okay, so what I'm, I'm doing now here is that once I, I just choose one number randomly from one to five, from one to five, if I choose one, then I will pick the sample A and E, uh, sorry, A and F. If I choose, get a number, get a two, then I will choose B and G as my sample. So everyone has equal chance being selected. The chance is one fifth, all right? But what's wrong with this kind of doing sample? There's no way you can get a sample with AC, let's say. The one that I just mentioned is called systematic sampling. This is a make life easy, but it's not exactly a simple random sample. But what I'm trying to say to you is that, okay, there are a little bit, <laughs> why we need this definition is to make sure that every possible combination and choose from the population, they have equal probability. If you don't specify that, then the example like that with 10 population of 10 elements, 10 individual, I want to choose two, but that A is accompanied with F, all right? And then B accompanied with G. So by doing so, once I choose A, I must, I must choose uh, F. And A cannot accompany with others in the sample. So that's not a good way. So, uh, so here is an example. Uh, yeah. Use Excel to, to do an example. Okay, here, suppose I want to choose, uh, out of a group of 20 mice, I want to choose five of them. 
So I label the mouse, or, or the mice, A, B, C, D, E, or 1 to 20. I have 20 of them, so I label it 1 to 20, or A to S, A, B, C, D, E, up to S. All right? And then select 5. All right? So, uh, so we can use the following three statements to do the tagging. So uh, this is a function to create uh, random numbers. This is to rank the random numbers. All right, and then we identify them, index. So what we're going to do is that I have these 20 numbers in one column, and then I ran, I, I ran them. Okay, I select a random, sorry. These are the mao, the mice, A up to S, for example, one to 20. Then I generate random numbers, random numbers, 20 of them. So each, each mouse will attach a random number. So now the job is easy. No, I decide maybe I choose the five mice with the, the smallest five random number attached to them. All right, then, the, then my job is done. All right, so this one is to rank Okay, I generate random number, and then I ran these random numbers according to descending order. If I choose zero in this four, uh, third argument. Then after that, I use this function called index. All right, this is to, to the index have two things. One is where to pick this. The second argument is the number that you specify. All right. Um, let me illustrate. Okay. okay. Now, these are the names of the mouse. Oh, A to T. T is the 20th. Okay, then I, the, I select a column, all right, to generate the random numbers. All right. Then I rank them. So, um, Unfortunately, the Excel, uh, once you press return, uh, the random number will recalculate again. So that's why you see the column C. Column C basically is to copy column B to column C. Copy the values. Copy the values. All right? So in other words, this is just a temporary working. So once I have 20 random number, I copy the value to the column C. Then I rank according to the column C from the smallest to the largest. Sorry, my, mine is from the largest. So this is the largest, so rank one. The second largest is this number, rank two. All right? So, so after I rank it, then I use this index. So the index is to choose the, the, the um, smallest. All right? So this one, choose the smallest, so it's choose to 20, so it's S. Then the next one, 19. As uh, K, where is, where is K? Uh? Mm. So apparently, <laughs> okay, I'm a little bit confusing. Uh, because it, once you copy, it change. So um, it's a little bit confusing. So basically, this is, to, this is to use the index. And this is the range I'm going to pick. And the value is according to the value, the rank of this. All right. I choose the first five ranks. All right. One, two, three, four, five. So it's not exactly here. So I have to figure out, modify it. All right. But basically, you can try it using these three functions, using the description here to generate a random sample. Uh, it's for your information. All right. I, I don't think we will ask you to do, do it. But if in case you ask, okay, I have this bunch of population, let's say I have 100, I want to select 10 out of this, how to do it using Excel. So you can try it. So those follow these steps, you will be able to select 10 randomly. All right. So, um, yeah. So uh, you just follow this step, you will generate your own, your own uh, sample. All right. 
Okay, I think I have run over time, so I, I stop here. All right, we'll continue tomorrow.